Hey there folks, I'm Mark, in affiliation with Spectrum Pulse, and this week is Recovery Week, it's long and plenty frustrating, and this, it's Billboard Breakdown. I've said for a while now that the week after an album bomb, that's not immediately followed by another one, it's always the toughest to get through. Yeah, the chart reset might be appreciated, and you can get a firmer idea on what can actually sustain momentum, but the new songs that fill in the gaps are not guaranteed to be great or special or true upstarts at all. A lot of them are just filling space until something bigger comes around, they just hop in to fill the gap. Unfortunately, it's not the biggest story this week, and if you've been aware of the hellscape of online music discourse right now you already have some idea of what's gonna come so let's get into it the top 10 and a new number one one that i honestly should have seen coming but i didn't seven by jungkook of bts featuring Lotto. Now, we'll get into the song's quality later on, but the win here was on the margins. It won thanks to streaming and getting just enough sales, and even there, it was outsold and lost on YouTube and the radio. And the song that nearly beat it, it's also new. Try That in a Small Town by Jason Aldean at number two. Again, we'll have to get into this one a lot more later on, but given how badly it lost on streaming, it's unlikely it's gonna last at this position in the top 10, whereas seven probably has a bit more runway. And even then, Last Night by Morgan Wallen at number three, it's not going anywhere. It is slipping a little bit on streaming and the radio might be peaking, but it's got so much inertia that it'll likely hold beyond this position. Then we got Fast Car by Luke Combs at number four, which is selling better and rising on streaming and the radio, but it also needs to close that margin. That's gonna be a tough sell. Then we got Calm Down by Rima and Selena Gomez at number five. They actually had a surprisingly good streaming week as the radio seems to be starting to slip very slowly. And then Fuck You Mean by Gunna rose up to number six on dominant streaming, even as the radio has been, unsurprisingly, really slow to get on board. It actually rose past Vampire by Olivia Rodrigo at number seven, which slipped both on sale sales and on streaming, and while it's getting this Herculean push on the radio, this might not be catching on in the way I think it was intended. Now compare that to Cruel Summer by Taylor Swift up to number 8, where the radio push might be even stronger, and that matches its strength across the board. In the right circumstances, this is probably going to make its run. Finally, we got Flowers by Miley Cyrus at number 9, on its way out as expected, and All My Life by Lil Durk and J. Cole at number 10, where it seems like it is starting to run out of gas in pretty much every channel. That takes us to our losers and dropouts, where, as I expected, the Speak Now album bomb is fading pretty fast. Also taking TQG by Carol G and Shakira, which will comfortably make the year-end list for 2023, and Waffle House by the Jonas Brothers, which absolutely will not. And that cascades into our losers as well, where from Speak Now, Taylor's version, we got I Can See You down to 33, Enchanted at 65, Back to December at 76, Mine at 81, and Sparks Fly at 95. Outside of that, the only other two losers from, were from Lil Uzi Vert's Album Bomb with Flooded the Face at 70, and Endless Fashion with Nicki Minaj at 99. Good riddance. Now we've got our returns and gains, and of course, in the latter group, over a third of the Hot 100 picked up traction, and it wasn't just rebounds here either. So let's try to segment this in some capacity and start off with the one new arrival from last week that got traction, La La by Mike Towers up to 48, along with the one return that got traction being Shake Some by DaBaby at 67. Good God. And since we didn't have any continued gains, we also saw some predictable spikes, like Barbie World by Ice Spice, Nicki Minaj, and Aqua at 27. It's going to spike more next week. And you also probably put Princess Diana in there at 49. Or Un Por Ciento by Grupo Frontera and Bad Bunny at 32. Or Put It On The Floor Again by Lotto and Cardi B at 42. Or Area Codes by Kali at 46. Or Pound Town 2 by Sexy Red, Nicki Minaj, and Tay Keith at 78. Then we got the big spikes from Morgan Wallen. Thought You Should Know at 30. Everything I Love at 72. Cowgirls with Ernest at 73. 
73, and even Stand By Me with Lil Durk at 59. But the regional Mexican surge was also out in full force. From Peso Pluma, we had Tulum with Grupo Frontera at 50. Lady Gaga with Capito Ballesteros and Junior H at 51. BZRP Music Sessions Volume 55 with Bizarre Rap at 69, and Bai at 74. Then from Fuerza Regida, we had Sabo Frieza at 45, and TQM at 56. And a rounded out from Yatritza Suincencia and Grupo Frontera, Fragile hits 71. Then there were the country songs. Next Thing You Know by Jordan Davis at 28. Dancing in the Country by Tyler Hubbard at 36. Bury Me in Georgia by Kane Brown at 40. Love You Anyway by Luke Combs at 41. Your Heart or Mine by John Party at 53. You, Me, and Whiskey by Priscilla Block and Justin Moore at 58. And Watermelon Moonshine by Lainey Wilson at 60. It was also a surprisingly decent week for Post Malone. Chemical bounced up to 43 and Morning hit 55. But it was also sadly a good week for David get a with I'm Good Blue with BB Rexa somehow still here at 31 and Baby Don't Hurt Me with Anne Marie and Coy Ray at 57. Finally... God, whatever's left with Peaches and Eggplants by Young Nudie and 21 Savage at 52. What It Is, Block Boy by Dochi and Kodak Black at 54. Daylight by David Kushner at 61. Popular by The Weeknd and Playboy Cardi and Madonna at 66. How the hell is this still around? Oh You Went by Young Thug and Drake at 68. And then ending off with See You Again by Tyler the Creator and Kaliuchis at 82. And Fight the Feeling by Rod Wave at 83. Now, if you can't tell by now, I'm not exactly pleased by a lot of our gains and when you look at the returns it's not much better with Girl and Mine by Parmalee at 100 Calling by Metro Boomin Sway Lee Nav and A Boogie with the Hoodie at 98 Save Me by Jelly Roll and Laney Wilson at 91 Ain't That Some by Morgan Wallen at 90 Jaded by Miley Cyrus at 88 and Truck Bed by Hardy at 75 Good lord this is bad Thankfully we got two returns that are at least somewhat interesting to talk about the first being the Revival of I See You with Coco Jones, now featuring Justin Timberlake. I gotta be honest, I haven't really gone that much to the song since I covered it, and with Justin Timberlake hopping on a remix a little bit too late for it to properly matter, it doesn't add that much that feels special. The song still feels kind of awkwardly produced to me, so adding Justin Timberlake's brand of overproduction, it's not exactly gonna help. But the real pleasant surprise was the remix of Dial Drunk by Noah Khan, now featuring Post Malone at 39 and yeah I absolutely think this is great they got a ton of ramshackle complimentary energy where if Noah Khan is barely on the rails in this song Post Malone is flying off of them it reminds me a lot of the chemistry between Chameleon Air and Crazy Bone back on Raiden and that is high praise indeed and now considering the song has some real streaming groundswell it's been sent to radio I mean come on let's make this out of nowhere surprise something that works on the Hot 100 in 2023 please but now we got to go to our new arrivals and we have a lot to get through here before discussing the very top starting off with number 97 johnny dang by that mexican ot paul wall and drody i knew about this coming for about a month now and i'm still not sure i properly believe it how in the nine hells do we have a song with Paul Wall on it in 2023? Now, for those of you who don't remember, because it was nearly 20 years ago, Paul Wall is a Texas rapper who had a brief run in the mid-2000s with a few minor hits and a guest star on Nelly's Grills in 2005. That song went to number one. He's actually stayed active, and I imagine his cosign might have gotten that Mexican OT and Drody through the door, and they're actually pretty damn good for it, as that Mexican OT has a great rollicking double-time flow and Drody is not far behind. Uh, yeah, of course the content isn't much to write home about in terms of drug dealing and flexing, but a lot of the attitude of the song feels quite distinctive, especially against that spare, echoing melody and the filmy percussion that is, it probably sounds a little bit more flimsy than it should. If anything, the big weakness that might come up with this song might be Paul Wall himself. His flow is a little bit better than I remembered it, but he's got nowhere near the comfort or precision of his peers, and if it wasn't for that final hook, I might have been left pretty disappointed and cold on the track. Overall, look, I wasn't looking for a 2000s Texas rap revival anytime soon, but if this is indicating something's brewing, I'm interested? 
This is really good. Check it out. Number 96, Fang For You by Rilo Rodriguez featuring No Cap. I was hoping one day, man, you could have a kid for real. See, you ride the car, they know you really work for rich men. Who's in the condo? Now I see you about to get a crib. It is not a good sign that I first covered Rilo Rodriguez back in 2021 and basically remembered nothing of him. So I didn't know what the hell to expect from this. And I can't say I was pleased with the pitch shifted Snow Allegra sample when we can't even get Snow Allegra on the Hot 100 proper. But hey, the watery melody sounded pretty. A little reminiscent of the 90s. And then Rilo Rodriguez came in with some of the ugliest auto-tune around his nasal voice and what kind of sounds like a future imitation and it doesn't remotely match with production that goes this soft. Now thankfully no cap sounds a little bit better basically on vocal production alone but then we get to the content and it's weirdly harder to follow than it should be. Rilo Rodriguez seems to be in this post breakup with this girl who has had other partners and he still has got messy feelings towards her. They might still be hooking up although one line references her being on her period and another has her pregnant by another guy i'm not sure of the timeline now no cap is a lot more forceful and direct in trying to profess his affections by of course buying her things although i wonder if the framing has him as the other man in this case but his verse also has these weird slowdowns and gaps in order to drive emphasis on his bars and I don't think they work as strongly as they should. I don't know, it's more weird than bad. I don't think I'm gonna return to it much, but I don't dislike it either. Number 93, Angels Don't Always Have Wings by Thomas Rhett. Good saving on me. Many angels don't always have wings. So Thomas Rhett put out a greatest hits album. I first remember covering his album, his very first one in 2013. This is getting exhausting. Anyway, this is the tacked on track you often find on one of those greatest hits compilations. And in this case, I think I can call it a big failure of execution rather than being bad all the way down. The writing's fine, story about a relationship where Thomas Rhett very clearly fucked up, but she actually stuck around, made things better, made him better. And Thomas Rhett is clearly trying to sell this like it really means it, including going into a falsetto that he was reportedly very insecure about and yeah for good reason it, it's pretty rough but i don't think the production really works here either it's trying for these ethereal liquid guitars and pedal steel and organ behind the waltz cadence but the percussion sounds so stiff and programmed against the clicking acoustics that it does not have the flow that it really should honestly kind of sounds like thomas rett trying to rip off a low rent dan and shay song and he's at least better than that so yeah i don't really like this at all next Number 92, Quema by Ryan Castro and Peso Pluma. Okay, I might have some frustrations with regional Mexican music on occasion, but you know what's worse? Peso Pluma choosing to make or guest star the sort of stale, played out reggaeton with as many production issues. This time with Ryan Castro on a song that would not have sniffed the Hot 100 without Peso Pluma's name. Yeah, the woodwinds in the back, they do not sound bad. There is something of a melodic hook here. And the percussion is more competently mixed than I expected. But it's not like these guys are saying anything remotely interesting when I translated the lyrics. I understand that Peso Pluma has wanted to not get pigeonholed in that regional Mexican sound, but his debut album showed that he could expand his sound in that genre without doing forgettable gunk like this. In other words, I don't care. Let's move on. Number 86, Turn Your Click Up by Quavo and Future. I cannot speak. We keeping the street. We keeping the street. I took a loss, but you still gonna get beat. You still gonna get beat. How much it costs? It never been cheap. It never been Here's a question. Who is honestly looking for a new solo Quavo album? I mean, I've never liked much of anything Quavo's done away from Migos. The massive album bombs he got did not help. So him teaming up with Future, it's not surprising, but I did not have expectations for this. And... Okay, you know what? I was a bit surprised how much I actually really liked the production with that bleeping synth against the piano chords and spare percussion. And you know, Future probably has the most southern flair in his voice that I've heard in a while, especially in his flow. Honestly, in this register, he sounds 
really good with it, and that tossed off diss at Russell Wilson did make me chuckle a bit. The problem is that outside of Future's weird presumptuousness when it comes to so many of his exes, it's still a song with an overly long hook from Quavo, where on his verse he really comes across like an asshole even compared to Future, where if the girl tells him to pay for the pussy, he takes her shopping and tells her to shut up, he seems like he thinks that he's doing her a favor by doing so, and then he makes poop joke. I mean, I don't dislike this. There was some potential. I can hear that. But goddamn, Quavo without Offset at this point, it's a miss. This should be better. Number 84, Save Me the Trouble by Dan and Shay. Okay, last time I reviewed a Dan and Shay song, I was hoping to dig in how they would fit with the shifting archetypes of new country music. And turns out, that song was old, and that didn't matter. Now for a newer song, and I don't even know why I thought they would even attempt to change, even going with that title. Because while this feels actually a bit more organic, and they're leaning on the harmonies a lot more, along with more pedal steel and a surprising amount of bombast, this still feels a lot more plastic than it should with all of those vocal overdubs. And then there's the lyrics where apparently this girl is interested in Dan or Shay, but if she's gonna love them and then leave them, given that they are such romantics at heart, they're trying to brush her aside at the bar. It feels like it's got all the problems that Honey I'm Good by Andy Grammer was accused of having, which is just a bizarre framing, especially when they sell it so sincerely. The one thing I will give Dan and Shay here is that it doesn't feel as flimsy or underpowered as they can be, and I am kind of a sucker for those boy band harmonies. Man, this one's weird to say. I gotta say it. Number 77, Rush by Troy Savant. No jokes here. When I first saw Troy Savant back on the charts, I could have sworn that he put out more music and just fell off my radar since I reviewed his 2018 album. But no, it turns out this is coming from his first album in five years. Anyway, with this single, he's actually going for something closer to Vintage House, with the textured bass groove and the faint synths and the pre-chorus and hook that feel very 90s. And honestly, given how his voice has deepened and fades in and out across the hazy mix, and he's leaning into a lot of the queer club vibes and the dance floor hookup, I actually think he sells it really well. I'm not sure I would call it exceptional or precisely anthemic in this lane in the way that the best house can be, but I gotta say, it does what it's trying to do so well, it's very easy to like. I know this is gonna go off in the right environment. Pretty damn good song. Maybe a little late to the house trend, but I'm not complaining. Check it out. Number 63, S91 by Carol G. Sometimes I forget, in spite of myself, that Carol G put out a project this year that got an album bomb of considerable size. I should not be this surprised that she debuted this high with a song that's not a single, but just something that she wanted to drop for the fans, with the title inspired by Psalm 91 from the Bible. And I'll admit that's a little weird for a track that's all about celebrating her success and saying that nobody can take it from her, and it plays in more minor tones in the instrumentation. But honestly, it is kind of effective in that lane. The quicker tempo on the rougher percussion that's got a pretty decent trap switch up on her second verse that against that guitar line kind of reminds me a little of Rosalia. That's not exactly a bad thing. And Carol G is really good at nailing that sultry, slightly imperious presence as she sees those who will try to follow in her wake. Might be almost a little bit too understated for its own good. There is a part of me that thinks that this could actually have some real staying power if it went just a little bit harder. But as it is, yeah, pretty damn good song too. Check it out. Number 47, Overdrive by Post Malone. Okay, I'm gonna say it. It's weird that Post Malone thus far has been one of the bright spots on the Hot 100 in 2023 for me. I liked Chemical, I really liked Morning, and his presence on the Dial Drunk remix I think is inspired, so I might actually be looking forward to that upcoming album. This 
feels a little bit more like an album cut with the understated orchestral backdrop, the hazy pop hook, and the oddly tired feel for his singing where the instrumental interlude is basically him whistling. But that fits what this song is. He's living his life way too hard. He's trying to find something that would be cool for someone where he otherwise feels so uninspired. Not exactly a good sign for a cut that otherwise feels a little undercooked. But you know what? The gentle twanging guitar line is almost pretty enough for me to excuse it. And I kind of get the feeling he's addressing this song at the audience as well, not a partner. I probably think it's the weakest of the singles thus far. It's not bad by any means though. I'll take it. Number 34, What Was I Meant For by Billie Eilish. So the first time I encountered this song properly is when I saw it in the Barbie movie. And it was a remarkably emotional moment in the final act that I'm not going to spoil, but raises a real question of what it means to be a symbol of empowerment when nothing has really changed in the meantime. And I can kind of see why Billie Eilish might find some resonance there, especially amidst creative struggles and questions of what her own artistic purpose is, where if she's being framed as a role model while struggling to capture an authentic feeling, well, how much power and change might translate from it? It's potent. And yeah, framing it in a delicately atmospheric piano ballad might be an easy template for her, but I gotta say it, Phineas is still one of the best in the industry of capturing that heartbreaking intimacy giving it a sense of scale, and her delivery against the gentle shimmer of the mix is simply goddamn stunning, especially as the overdubs open up across the final hook. I don't know what to say, folks. The song just crushes in the context of the film. On its own, it's so powerful as hell. Billie Eilish just keeps on doing it. Absolutely great in all its forms. It probably will not get pushed, but it should. Unlike number two, Try That in a Small Town by Jason Aldean. So one thing I've learned with how big country music has been in 2023, a lot of folks, especially on social media, do not know that much about country, especially pop fans or music journalists who took every excuse to ignore it. Ergo, a lot of y'all are very new to the Jason Aldean experience, seemingly confirming everyone's worst impressions of Nashville and country music, but it's always been so much more complicated and much uglier with Jason Aldean, who holds views that are less representative of country than many think, but more than some others want to admit. And he's also a brand unto himself that's kept his largely indie label BBR afloat for over a decade and thus cannot be easily deplatformed. Hell, he probably would have gone away now naturally as his albums continue to underperform if you just ignored him into oblivion. Hell, his entire PR team quit after the drama between his wife and Marin Morris last year. He was very much on the way out. But that would require if y'all knew or cared enough about country music to not jump on the very obvious bait. And he played the outrage marketing like a fiddle that of course is not on this song. Because let's be real. This is a stodgy Jason Aldean cut where the bass line had a bit of promise, but most of the percussion sounds very programmed, the clap is painfully mechanical, and the choppier riffs are trying to imitate Michael Jackson's beaded on that embarrassment of a solo. Let's be real, nobody gives a shit about the sound from Jason Aldean. The discourse has been about the content. And the content of this is vile. Plain and simple. It plays the same sort of reactionary horseshit that has been the undercurrent of Jason Aldean's songs really since the late 2000s and is now just out in the open for all the blustering threats made against folks who would commit crime that they could potentially get away with in a city, but in a small town face a very different sort of violence. Which in the music video picks up some codified racial and lynching undertones given that particular courthouse. And no, I do not buy that it was unintentional in any of the location scouting for said music video given what the song is about. Now, there will be some who will think that I'm making way too much out of the vigilante violence endorsed in a song like this. They'll play a lot of whataboutism, pointing at hip hop or drill, as if I haven't repeatedly spoken about the violent turf wars that have been driven to charting success in the past several years, or they'll claim it's just art, 
They'll point to other similar songs in country with similar regressive tendencies, even lynching text and subtext like Beer For My Horses by Toby Keith and Willie Nelson. Because again, police violence tends to be given a greater pass. And in my opinion, probably shouldn't have, even if that song might have more excuses in the veins of heightened stylism. And even then, I would argue it's a product of the ugly Bush era conservatism of the early 2000s and it is aged badly. And you know, at that point, I could highlight that Jason Aldean is not even from a small town. He didn't even write this song. Or how all of this feels like such a performative put on for a bunch of guys who want to think this makes their dicks big. I don't need to do that. Calling out his hypocrisy is not going to work, liberals, because he doesn't care to engage in your discourse. Ergo, you shouldn't care either. You shouldn't engage. Thus, what I'm angry about is that this song was already failing on Nashville radio because Music Row sure as hell does not like this kind of controversy. And yet because some centrist liberal journalist said TikTok didn't bother to care about country as a whole, recognize these trends, how to just leave this shit to rot with the rest of Jason Aldean's career and every other lazy bit of reactionary outrage bait because again, the dunk's what matters to you. And that's why this became a thing. Even if I would put money on this falling off the charts in record time, it's what happens. Leave the disinfectants to the professionals. And as one of the professionals who has had to deal with this guy for a decade, yeah, fuck this. Leave Jason Aldean and his ilk to get more heat stroke at concerts after playing golf all day in front of some increasingly shrinking crowds. And finally, number one, Seven by Jumcoop featuring Lotto. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, seven days a week, every hour, every minute, every second, you know not every night. You know, I'm not surprised that the BTS army swung in for a save here, edges out Jason Aldean. I just wish it had been from a member that had more artistic flair and inspiration. All the more glaring because I've covered more solo BTS projects, I know they have it. Counting the days of the week when you describe how you're fucking someone every day, it's painfully lazy songwriting. Especially with the hazy guitar loop behind the two-step garage percussion and that weirdly ugly synth. And it's not like Jungkook and Lotto have any chemistry at all. Jungkook's trying to be a little bit more romantic, even on the explicit version of the song, which I don't think works for his vocals. Whereas Lotto's brash presence in reference to big energy in reverse, it's really just a Mariah reference, I'd argue it doesn't work at all. They don't match with each other. Bizarrely, this was a track that was co-written by John Bellion, so I guess that explains why it's even remotely catchy. But let's be real, this is radio filler with little coherent personality. It's not bad, but it's not remotely worth caring about. And and it annoys me to no end that BTS and its biggest members and their biggest hits have often been when they're at their least interesting. Can that somehow change sometime? Someone at their label fix that? Well, that was our week. It went way too goddamn long. And the worst is obvious. Try that in a small town by Jason Aldean. But for dishonorable mention, staying in country, I'm giving that to Angels Don't Always Have Wings by Thomas Rhett, mostly because of that falsetto in production. Best of the week's actually a lot harder. Well, okay, maybe not. What I Was Made For by Billie Eilish has that. But I'm giving a tie for honorable mention. Rush by Troy Sivan and Johnny Dang by That Mexican OT, Drody, and Paul Wall. Yeah, I'm serious with that one. Next week, I imagine the Barbie soundtrack's gonna make the most impact. Outside of that, we might have a week or two of breathing room. We will have to see. But until then, I'm Mark. You're watching Billboard Breakdown, affiliated with Spectrum Pulse. And I'll see you next time.